today we've heard from multiple stakeholders from schools, law enforcement, and behavioral health. But now we are going to hear from the real experts, um, those with lived experience. This panel will describe their interactions with adults in their lives, from families to juvenile justice system gate gatekeepers, and most importantly, explain what they felt was effective and maybe what hurt them. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Bobby Taylor, Stanford Bradley Jr., um, who will share their wisdom and provide insight about how we can change the system. And Lincoln Arneal will be moderating the panel. What is, so just to recap the end part there is uh, we'll kind of, I have some questions that we'll kind of ask to get perspectives and insights uh, that they can share. And then at the end, if you want to have any questions, uh, you can ask those as well. So uh, I will turn it over to Stanford and Bobby, just have them introduce themselves and kind of uh, you can tell a little bit about yourself and why you are passionate about juvenile justice. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby Taylor. I was born and raised in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I'm a full-time student at Southeast in the transfer program, and I hope to um, get a degree in so sociology here at the university. Um, I work for Think of Us, um, which is a national nonprofit organization um, that works in the child welfare sector. Um, and I'm also a mother of three kids. And I'm passionate about juvenile justice because um, I've been an advocate in the child welfare space for five and a half years, but um, people really don't know that the majority of my experience came from juvenile justice, and I spent seven years in the juvenile justice system, probation, congregate care, the YRTCs. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm passionate about it. Um. My name's Stanford Bradley Jr. I was also born and raised uh, right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I've been working with youth and juvenile justice for about seven years. And so kind of what got me started working with juvenile justice, I was going through a time in my life where I found myself being a part of the system. And so with that, um, I started working with youth and then that turned into me um, taking over and being um, uh, running an after school program and um, a summer program at the Malone Community Center. And so with that, I've just been um, really active with the community and uh, with youth. And so that kind of what got me here. Great. Thank you. So the title of our uh, panel is What I Wish You Knew. Uh, and I think we're going to turn that on internally now. So thinking back to your first day that you were involved in probation, prior to anything that you had been involved with the system at that point, uh, even your first day in front of court, what conversation would you want to have had with yourself and what would you have told yourself to prepare you for the road ahead? Um, yeah, the conversation I would have had was to not be afraid um, to express the needs that I had. So in my experience, um, I just felt that being vulnerable was a vulnerability that made me weak. Um, and a lot of people didn't know what was going on at home. And so um, I didn't know that advocating for myself could get me what I needed. Um, and I wish that I would have known that. Um, I also <laughs> wish I would have known that um, the things that I was experiencing just in normal adolescent development was normal. Um, I, I just felt really lost um, and really misunderstood. But that's, that's just normal. Um, for me, I, when uh, my situation happened, my first time going up in front of the court, um, I had an older brother that was involved in the system, so I knew some about it, but I didn't experience it for myself until I had to. And so with that, I would have you know, told myself to just be calm and just you know, focus on myself and kind of where I want to go and what my future wanted to be. Because for me, I thought you know, it was over and that I was just just going to stay in a bad place and I was never going to get out. And so one thing I would have told myself is just, you know, to just hold down, buckle down and just, you know, figure out what I want to do and how I can get there the best way. Great. Thank you. All right. We're going to take that question and flip it on its head. So what do we, we know what you want to know. What do you want them to know of the, the, the people, the juvenile justice professionals, um, people like that? What would Going back to your first day, what, what, what do you wish that you could have told them to make your experience better? Um, Sanford, we'll start with you here. 
that that I, you know, I'm scared, I'm nervous, um, I'm lost, I don't know how things are going to turn out. So I'm, you know, I, I'm anxious and my anxiety is going to be up because, you know, this is for some people, this their first experience. It could be new to them and mm-hmm. it could be a lot to handle. And so a lot of them, it it can start to take a a, a mental toll on their mental health and kind of put them in a spot that if you're not patient and understanding with them, you, you know, you can do more harm than good in yeah. those situations. Yeah, I wish, um, I wish my probation officer, my caseworker, um, I just wish that they really knew that it was okay to be human um, because that would have made me feel more comfortable. I also wish that they would have kind of made the things that I was going through digestible. And by that I mean explaining things in a way that I was able to understand as an 11 and 12 year old um, that was still in middle school. Um, And I I really didn't understand what was going on until I was probably towards the end of high school. And so um, really making sure that I understood what was going on and and what my rights were. um, I wish you guys would have known that. Thank you. All right, Bobby, we'll, we'll stick with you. And um, what helped you affect change in your life, kind of, uh, to get out of and eventually move on from the juvenile justice system? What, what were the changes or people that kind of helped you move to a positive track? So um, my experience is a bit dated. Uh, I'll just forewarn you guys. And, and my experience wasn't good, I have to be honest. The entire experience was not good. I think the only reflection that I can really think of that was okay was my experience in Boys Town. Um, And that's just because it was like a family-based setting that was as close to normal as normal could get. But, um, you know, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. The thing that changed me was nobody fighting for me um, to go back to juvenile justice court when I turned 18. So what had happened was I ran away from Geneva Um, and I was on run for a very long time. Um, And when they finally, uh, when life finally caught up with me, um, I was 18 and I had caught some adult charges. Um, And after that, uh, nobody fought for me and I went to uh, the actual jail here in Lincoln um, where I spent six months in the adult facility. Um, And and really that kind of changed me. I, I really felt like okay, no one's gonna fight for me, no one's gonna fight my battle, no one's going to help me get out of my own situation. I have to do it and I have to defy all the odds that people have set before me. Um, I remember staff at the YRT would say, you're just gonna end up in prison right after you end out of, or right after you get out of here. Um, and I didn't want to prove them right. Like I knew I had potential, I, I know I have potential. I still you know, am striving to be better every single day. Um, and, and that experience transformed me. Thank you, Bobby. Um, so for me, um, I was kind of one of the lucky ones that when I got in trouble with the system my first time, I was able to understand that jail wasn't a place for me. And so with that, I was able to join a program here in Lincoln that helped kids without work experience that um, are going through the system, it helps them uh, gain employment and gain work skills. And so through that program, um, I started at the Malone Center working. It was in the summertime, so they allowed me to work up to 40 hours at that point. And so for that whole summer, I spent it working 40 hours at the Malone Center working our after school program with the kids. And so with that, I, you know, I started to enjoy the time I was spending at the Malone Center. And so that just allowed me to see more about you know who I was and what I wanted to do and how my life can impact others and so with that I just you know I kept working at the Malone Center and then within the next five years I was running a program and then you know this year I started working at Cedar Shelter as kind of one of their lead staff in the shelter and working with kids in probation and you know kids that are homeless and things like that and so because of the opportunity of being able to work with youth and start impacting lives during um, one of the lowest points in my life kind of helped me figure out what I wanted to do and kind of affect it the way I navigated through my probation and juvenile justice time. What was the name of that program you were involved with? Um, It was called the YES program. Mm -hmm. So it's down at the Southeast Community College. Remember what YES stood for? 
I do not. <laughs> we'll give a shout out. Yeah, make sure these programs are making a positive difference. Make sure we give a shout out to them. So the Yes program down at Southeast. Yeah, I don't. It was about that was about seven, eight years ago. So I don't even remember well, the name of it. Well, it's good. They made made a difference. It kind of put you on the right track and led led to a career. Yes, yeah. yeah I would, in in some ways, I would say that opportunity almost saved my life because mm -hmm. the the people I were hang, I was hanging out with during that time, a lot of them are doing ten plus life or ten plus years in jail and so you know being able to work at them alone those 40 hours took 40 hours out of my week to not be around people I probably shouldn't have been around. That's cool. Good. And you may have touched on this a little bit but I mean who are who are some people in your life that would, as you're going through these tough times that you were able to rely upon that you trusted and if it was nobody that, that's okay I mean what uh who were who the support system that you relied, up, relied upon to get you out of those low moments? Stanford, we'd start with you. Um, so it would be uh, Nate Woods was the director of the Malone After School Program. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he gave me a chance, an opportunity, and he had been working at the Malone 13 years at this point. And um, with my situation, you know, there was limited opportunities I was going to get. And so with him giving me that opportunity, me and him kind of built um, a bond and a mentor relationship. And he was also... Um, a black man too, so he was really somebody that I could look at and he he could tell me things that I knew he experienced at one point in his life and so his knowledge um, helped play a big part in kind of molding me and helping me build as um, a youth advocate and then uh, my dad was probably another big one. He was the director of a community center here in Lincoln for about 21 years and so with the work he did he was able to kind of really, you know, focus more in on me and kind of what I need at that time and kind of help me out more than he probably had before. Cool. Good. Bobby? Yeah. Um, again, to be honest, I had a lot of great people. Um, the problem was they were never stable relationships. I would complete a program and never see that worker again, or I would complete my 10 weeks of therapy and never see that therapist again. Uh, the people that were stationary was my probation officer and um, sometimes my caseworker. You know, those fluctuate as well. They're in and out. Um, but yeah, it, the staff at the placements that I went to, um, they just didn't understand. They weren't trained well. They weren't trauma-informed. Um, but like the community workers, um, maybe like Jody Payne, she used to be my tracker. Um, and I still have contact with her today. Like, she really, really helped me. She saw me for a little girl that I was, even though I wanted to be as grown up as I wanted to be. Um, but yeah, again, I just have to reiterate that none of these good relationships were stable. You mentioned that a little bit. Uh, thinking about, I mean, one of the things that you want to, as you're going through these struggles is looking, so someone meets you where you're at, so you feel heard and you feel connected. Um, was there a time when you felt like this person gets it, this person's meeting me where I am and is actually hearing what I'm, not to try, what I'm trying to say and not just checking boxes on a form or crossing off things off of a checklist too? I mean, so is there an example of a time when you felt that you were really heard and seen as a person who was struggling with life? Yeah, again, I'd have to shout out Jody Payne. I don't think she's in this field anymore. I think she's selling insurance, but... No, um, no she is. She, she is? is. She's yeah. selling insurance? Um, no, she works with me at Cedars. Oh, Jody Payne. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, um, I have her on Facebook. I don't have her, you know, <laughs> in the professional aspect. But, um, you know, I used to skip school all the time, and she would catch me. Like, she would drive through my neighborhood until she found me, and she would... Um, you know, just have a pep talk with me, you know, like she, you know, really went through the struggle herself and she was trying to teach me the lessons that she had to learn um, and, and just kind of giving me strength through it all. She knew what was going on at home. Um, she was one of the only people that I trusted. It was just, she couldn't do anything about it, but she still um, just saw me for who I was. Uh, so again, shout out to Jody. Did anybody, anybody feel like you met you where you were at and make you feel heard? Um, well, I would say the, the kids at the Malone, they would come every single day. And so with them, I was able to build kind of a bond and, you know, play a part in their life. And so with that, I kind of had to look at myself in a way of not being another person to 
disappoint the kids that, you know, were coming. So if I still was getting in trouble and they were seeing, you know, me popping up on mug shots and things like that, then that would kind of alter the way they looked at, you know, their, you know, well, the kids. So the kids at the Malone Center, they're all pretty much low income and African American kids. And so me being African American male, I took it on as a responsibility of working with so many uh, minority kids to be the person that they can see in a position of doing good and stuff like that, because not all the time do you get to see that in the community. Cool. And so with that, I kind of allowed myself to hold myself to a certain standard so I wouldn't let down the kids that we served at the Malone. So you had to be the role model in that right. situation. Right, so, so me being the role model for them kind of made a big impact on my personal growth. Uh, looking back on your experiences within the juvenile justice system, what was missed and what, what could have been done better? It's a very broad question. Take that however you want, but what was, what was missed? Um, so I was on probation for, so when I got sentenced, I was sentenced to probation for two years. And um, I got off in the first six months because um, I did, I, w I was a kid that really didn't get in a lot of trouble. So when they put me on probation, they didn't really have to monitor me that much. But at the same time, I didn't see my probation officer until a week before I discharged. Mm -hmm. So I was on for six months and I seen him the last week before I discharged. And so I didn't really get to benefit a lot from what services probation offered. You know, I just was lucky enough that I didn't want to be back in the courthouse and back in the system that I took it upon myself to figure out how to change my behaviors and kind of fix where I was messing up at. And so, you know, not actually getting the services from probation mm -hmm. was kind of a big thing. Did they give you an explanation why they didn't see you for the first five and a half months? Or? I didn't really ask. I was like, you know, I'm off probation, I'm off probation. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't really ask him yeah. why I ain't seen him. But when he, uh, the first time I heard from him within, he texted me and said, hey, I'm doing a drug test on this day and you'll be discharged by this day. And that, I showed up and that was how it went. Bobby, what was, what was missing? What could yeah. be done better? You know, I think one of the biggest missed opportunities was my academic career. Um, they never asked this, uh, but I had been um, tested out in the third grade for um, the advanced placement or the diff placement. Um, so I was academically gifted, and um, that was never pursued. That was never a question. Um, they didn't really pay attention to my school. Uh, they just paid attention to my attendance if I was there and whether I was failing or not. It was just kind of like check boxes. Um, but what they didn't understand is, you know, I started skipping school, but I started skipping school because lights like these, not saying anything bad, but um, they give me headaches because I have astigmatism and my mom had never taken me to the eye doctor and I never knew I had astigmatism or needed eyeglasses. Um, and so when I started skipping school is because I was getting really, really severe headaches, but school was a place where I thrived. And so they just thought it was an act of defiance. They thought I didn't want to be there. They thought I was out doing drugs. And that wasn't the case. But, um, you know, I just feel like when you speak things into a child so often um, and just have, like, I don't know, the um, assumption that they're doing something, they're going to do it, right? And that's what I did. And so I just started skipping school. I would go hang out with friends that I shouldn't be hanging out with. And um, eventually it just became a pattern. Um, but yeah, school was somewhere that I could thrive, um, and they just didn't pursue that. They didn't get to know me well enough uh, to be able to know that about me. How old were you when you finally got that diagnosis? Yeah, I was, it wasn't until I went to Boys Town, um, and that was when I was 15, and I started skipping school because of the astigmatism in fifth grade. Um, our, uh, our school, our elementary school was getting redone, and so um, if you guys remember, a lot of the kids were getting shipped out to Abbott Sports Complex for schooling, um, and there was no natural light. It was just fluorescent lights all the time, um, and then that habit just kind of carried on into... Uh, into sixth grade, seventh grade, yeah. Did, once you got that diagnosis and kind of the, was that an aha moment of realizing that that's what's going on? Did your behavior change after that? 
Um, well, I mean, Boys Town, like I said, was one of the best placements anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, I was getting 4.0s there, and I was really thriving in school. But um, when I asked the doctors, is this why I have headaches? Um, they were like, yeah, this could be a reason. You know, like your, your vision is naturally blurry, and it's always moving. And um, this could have been one of the reasons. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, here's a statement. Uh, system partners should listen to a person's lived experience. Do you agree with that statement? Why or why not? Are you asking me? Yeah. Yes, we'll start with you, Bobby. Okay. Um, absolutely. They should absolutely listen, but I believe it should be more than listening. I think it should be partnering with lived experience to really transform the system. Um, the way it needs to be transformed. The traditional practices just aren't working anymore, and without lived experience, we're not gonna get to where we need to be uh, to transform systems for well-being of young people. So I guess, statement again, system partners should listen to a person's lived experience. How do you react to that, Stanford? Um, like she said, I, I agree. I think that you know people who, who've been there and have walked those paths could, you know, help bring ideas to the table that people who have not been in the shoes or situations similar to that, they might not understand you know, what's going on. So having people that have been there and kind of been in situations and have more of an understanding in relation to the people that are going through those problems will help the people that are going to school and learning about it to kind of create a, a change and create better ways that we can assist the youth that we deal with. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so. Sanford, you've talked a lot about how you finally, you found a good community at the Malone Center, dealing with other African-American males kind of in your life there too. Uh, what are ways and ideas that we can incorporate different voices in the system reform so we can have those more of those connections where people can, that they identify with can help them build good relationships? Can we repeat that one more time for I So looking at what happened, the positive impact working at the Loan Center did, some of the people that you identified with and can relate to, so how can we as a system uh, look to incorporate different voices and different identities into system reform? Um, I think there's a lot of, like especially during the times right now where there's you know, a lot of the race stuff going on, there's a lot of people that um, want to get involved and have good ideas and can bring good things to the table, and I think we, they should, we should be allowed, you know, to sit in on conversations that are going to impact our community and the kids that, you know, we have to deal with in our community. So kind of bringing people that can relate to the situations to the table will kind of help create a better mm -hmm. solution. Yeah. yeah, I think that just a repeated um, theme that I see, not only with my experience, but listening to some of the other experiences and national experiences, is we're continuously isolated from the community, community supports, community networks, community nonprofits, and those places are stationary. Those places will probably be there for the next 10 years, and those relationships are important to form and to have. Um, because the system should not be in our lives forever, right? But, but these places could be. Um, these uh, supportive adults or, or other young people where they have supportive spaces will be there. Um, and so I think just really being intentional about creating spaces that are um, in the community um, and allowing partnerships to form that is in the community uh, where people can go when the system isn't there to catch them. You know, Bobby, just, you, you're very passionate about making sure that all voices are heard throughout the state, too, and you're a very big advocate for our partners and communities out in western Nebraska, too. How can we make sure that their voices are, are incorporated out there and what looks like a fairly less diverse population, too? How can we make sure that young people are seen in those communities? Yeah, I think, um, I don't want to speak too soon, um, but I think there are some things in, in place where we should have panels like this all over the state in every single community. Um, with equal representation just to inform other young people, to inform other professionals across the state. And I think there should be some spaces where young people are brought together where they can um, really connect with one each other um, and really know that uh, it is possible to defy the system and the stigma. Um, so yeah, that's, I feel like, is a, is a good start.
and as a personal plug, we have a probation youth council that serves the entire state. <laughs> so I think we have an application or information on the projecteverlast.org website. Uh, these, two, these two are kind of our, our elder statesmen of the probation youth council, but so we, we, we welcome younger people to join us in that. So there's my personal plug. Thanks for leading me to that, Bobby. Uh, so, I mean, we've talked a lot about the past. We've been very focused on what happened in the past, too. But I want to hear a little bit about, I mean, you both are in kind of uh, human services industries. You wanted to help at-risk young people, too. What led you to that? What, uh, why did you feel like that was the right field for you to work in, at least at this point in your life? Stanford, well, we can start with you. Um, so for me, just, you know, being able to impact kids' lives and be a role model and somebody that, you know, they can look up to was big for me because I didn't have a teacher that looked like me until I got to middle school. So I was in seventh grade when I finally had a teacher that was also, you know, a black man that I could, you know, be like, oh, you know what, maybe I can be a teacher because now I've seen a black teacher. And so for me, it was kind of taking on, you know, I, I want to be if there's another black kid out there that's looking for somebody to identify with and say, you know what, I want to be like him when I get older, then, you know, I want it to, to be that person and kind of fill those shoes for other people that needed that person. Cool. Cool. Bobby, what about you? What's led you to this, this kind of field? Um, well, to be quite honest, again, uh, I'm all about honesty. Um, I worked a lot of odd end jobs. Like, I was a manager at Dunkin' Donuts. I worked in a metal factory. But something that I stayed with was advocacy from the time I aged out of care until um, I think I was, like, 22. And I was just sitting at work one day, and I, I really realized, like, when I advocate or when I'm in spaces such as these or when I'm in trainings, um, it's really healing me because I'm understanding my experience more every single day and it doesn't feel like work. Um, and I want others to feel that way too, right? Like I want others to heal in ways that I was able to heal by learning um, all the information that the professionals know um, but just don't tell other young people. Um, and so that's kind of what led me to the work. And just, just the fact, like, it doesn't feel like work to me, right? Like, everyone always says, like, the older people always say, um, go for a job where you enjoy it and you're passionate and it doesn't feel like work and, and you're inspired every day. And, and that's what this work does for me. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'm here today. All right, we have one more question. I'll ask the group, then we'll turn it over to the audience. You can ask a question, whether it's submitting it online or we have mics in the room we can go to that but so you're on notice it's your warning uh but even further down the road bobby i want to what are your goals and aspirations what do you want to where do you see yourself five ten years what do you want to be doing long term long term um, um, whatever long term <laughs> means to you so i feel like my long term goal has kind of really came true recently but um you know in in the next five, ten years, I want to get my degree in sociology. I just think lived experience paired with a degree like that um, just enhances um, what I can do for systems change and systems reform um, that much more. Um, I also want to help national partners just kind of spread the love across the nation for all um, young people that they interact with because um, I feel like it's really selfish. Um, to only stay in Nebraska, uh, not moving, but just keep the work in Nebraska. I want to spread it all around because I feel like um, we're going to be doing some really amazing things. And then maybe in like 15 years, the, these are like goals, goals. Um, but I really feel like I could be a champion in the legislator or some public office um, where I'm making changes um, with the laws for young people and for people that are um, disadvantaged or just systems reform in general that I see inequities all over the place. Um, so yeah, so it's like my the vote for Bobby in 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Stanford, what about you? What's the road ahead? Um, so recently me and my dad, we started our own nonprofit. So we, you know, we had both worked for other nonprofits and we kind of wanted to, we seen things that should be get, begin done and services that should begin offered that weren't. And so we started our nonprofit, Untapped Potential. And so with that, I want to be able to help more kids from, you know, in my community, stay in our community and help our community be better. And so whether that's being a mentor, helping them, helping you find employment, helping them with their academics or whatever it is, I just want to be able to continue to help more kids, want to help more people. 
So then that way, you know, the world can at some point be a better. Untapped better Potential is the name of the nonprofit? Yep, yep. Untapped Potential. Awesome. What are, you, are you, what are you working on now? I mean, you said you have all these ideas. Anything, um, projects so, right now you're doing? Yep, so we have a group that's actually running this Thursday, um, the 1st of October, and it's called um, YARP, which is Youth Against uh, Prejudice and Racism. And so with that, we want to help kids um, learn the best ways and the right ways to protest and the right ways to effective make change and, you know, use their voice in the best way that they can. Awesome. It's great work. Hopefully, Thank you. Hopefully just the start of it, too. So. Thank you. All right, anybody want to come to the mic and ask a question of our panelists? Yeah, we got one right there. In the, in the, in the. She has the mic over there. Or, or you, 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 I'll come to you. Stephanie, I'll come to you. There we go. Hi, my name's Tia. Hi, Tia. Um, um, I want to know what some advice you would give to someone that's looking to go into the human service field, like it, just in general. And I'm more asking for myself. <laughs> <laughs> just throw that out there. Me? Oh, um, you know, I would really be conscious of the secondary trauma that um, it can have. Uh, where, wherever you are in the human services field, there, um, there's a lot of things wrong that are fundamentally, or well, there are a lot of fundamental things that are wrong with the system that we have to navigate every day. Um, and when you see that happen to people over and over and over again, um, it can really take a toll on you and, and be traumatic. Um, and that's if you've never experienced trauma. Everyone's experienced some type yeah. of trauma, but it's just really, really heavy work. And so um, being mindful of self-care, being mindful that um, the smallest, smallest change that you make can have the biggest lasting impact. Um, and it's okay to just be satisfied with that. I like that. Um, my advice would be that, you know, there's a lot of bad, there's going to be a lot of bad days, but there's going to be a lot of good days that make up for the bad. And so working with kids that are going through some of the most difficult times in their life could make you like, for me, it like sometimes it bothers me. So sometimes at night, I'm, you know, when kids leave our shelter and they're going on to a new placement and you just don't know how they're going to like that placement, how that's going to go, it kind of starts to bother you sometimes. And so making sure that you're, you know, like she says, self-care and taking care of your own mental health so then that way you can help other people. Because if you don't take care of yourself, it's going to be hard to help take care of other people. Thank you. I, even though I'm not a panelist, I'll say that my advice is to go for it and uh, just put yourself out there, make connections. I remember right a month after I started my job in Nebraska Children, uh, Bobby came up to me after at, at legislative days and said, what more can I do? Uh, so we got we get opportunities that come our way from partners and things like that, and just said, here, are you interested in this? And Bobby said yes. So she just started showing up to things and led to where she is today. I mean, not saying that her coming up to me, she, came, she went to multiple people, not just on one person. She went to multiple people in Nebraska children in the community and uh, people in the human services industry and said, what can I do to have my voice heard and get involved? So uh, it's scary. I'm sure Bobby can attest to that, but to put yourself out there, but uh, it was, I mean, it's impressive when you, when you see that passion and want to help out. So that's my advice. I've got two questions. Bob, you mentioned organizations in the community that should be around and should help because of the lasting impressions that they leave on young people. While you were going through your thing as a youngster, while you were going through your thing as a youngster, would you have reached out to those organizations on your own as a youngster or because of you being in the system kind of introduced you to those particular organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt, um, I can think of one on the top of my head, and that's the hub, the central access point for young adults. And they get it, right? Like they're, they're doing case management level work, but like they're not case managers, but they absolutely get what it is to be a young person and how to serve young people. Um, and I didn't come into contact with them uh, through a caseworker, through probation or anything like that. I came into contact of word of mouth from my best friend. Um, and if I wouldn't have had that, if I wouldn't have had the opportunity with Project Everlast, which is through NCFF, 
I wouldn't be where I am today. I probably would have <laughs> went down the rabbit hole and not a good one, um, you know, and, and the, those are the exact spaces where young people need to be connected to early on. I mean, the hub serves young people 14 to 26. Like, that is a huge age range, and they only, the majority of the young people that they do serve are 18 to 26, so they're missing so many young people. Um, and it, it, it's, it's devastating, right? Like, why are there so many young people falling through the cracks when they don't have to? Um, so to answer your question um, simply, yes, absolutely. I think um, I would have accessed those when I was going through what I was going through at home. So I heard, I heard both of you guys talk about relationships, you know, Jody, Nate, your father, you know, to be able to connect with somebody, what do you do now? You know, you talk about African American males seeing the first African American male teacher. You know, how important is that cultural experience when working with young people, especially people of color? Is it for them to see someone that they can model after? It's for me. It's huge because you when you can't when you don't see people in professions that are like your dream jobs you only see like the the athletes and the rappers and the actors and things you don't see the the principals and the teachers and the police officers and those everyday people that you know do very important work that don't get um they don't people really don't think about it and so like for me i was when i was going through my situation i was thinking about like what i was interested in and i couldn't really see any of them being real because I didn't know anybody that did it. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know a business owner and there wasn't one in my family. There wasn't a teacher in my family or anybody that went to college in my family. And so just kind of looking at, you know, what my opportunities were, I couldn't really, I couldn't really imagine a lot. And with that, I started, you know, helping the kids at the Malone and just really putting a lot of focus into them being confident in their self-identity and who they are, so then that way they can continue to grow and have the imagination to be whatever they want it to be that I didn't have at that time. And just one last question. Either of you, as the youngsters, were you on medications that were prescribed for your behaviors or anything like that? You know, that's something that we're kind of discussing in spaces today. And yes, I was. When I was in Geneva, they had me on medications that I absolutely did not need to be on. Um, and I saw it over and over and over again. Um, Boys Town wasn't so much like that. Uh, I wasn't in the group homes that long, maybe like 72 hours and I was gone. Um, but yeah, those, um, those spaces absolutely forced us to be on medications based on a doctor's note. For me, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't really stay, so I had just a situation that was a bad decision in a moment that kind of altered a lot in my life, but I was doing a lot of things leading up to it, and so I wasn't a person that they thought should be medicated for any reason, and so I never had, you know, been on medication or anything like that for it, but for me, it was um, when I did start wanting to change, I started to do therapy, and so with that just kind of really allowed me to, you know, talk to somebody and then kind of really get out a lot of the issues I was going through. So a lot of my issues were kind of my thoughts and kind of my own things. And so being able to do therapy and, you know, express those in a, a safe space kind of really helped me more than I think any else, anything else could have. Well, thank both of y'all for what you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions from the crowd or Tracy, do you have online questions at all? No, don't be shy online. Oh, what a tough crowd. <laughs> you hope we have Mike coming behind you there. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentations. That takes a lot of guts, and you're wonderfully articulate and powerful speakers. Um, I'm wondering, did you ever meet people in the system, adults, um, you've, you've talked a little bit about this, um, Bobby, um, who actually melt, made you feel more at risk instead of less? And if so, um, what was their behavior like that made you feel like they were a risk factor instead of you? Yeah, um, 
I, I remember referencing one of the staff members uh, in Geneva um, and also in the detention center. I don't want to neglect the fact that the detention center was absolutely traumatizing. Um, but yeah, um, I think that just some of the ways that they would talk to young people, and not just me, right? Like that's just my experience. I don't have room to speak on it, everybody's experience that I witnessed, but it wasn't just me that was talked to, um, let me say crazy. Um, it, it wasn't just me. It was a lot of young people and it triggered a lot of young people and it created outbursts for a lot of young people, um, including myself, which held us back in the program. Um, and so I absolutely do think that um, there were some, some people uh, that were risk factors that were um, not helping us get through the program or, or change. Uh, they, were, they were hurting us through the process and making it more traumatic. But I also just kind of want to add to that, right? Like my, my experience was negative, but I don't want to neglect the fact that um, in the five years of experience that I've had in advocacy, I have met some amazing people in this space. I have met um, amazing people in juvenile justice and child welfare um, on the state level and the legislator. They are amazing and they are truly fighting for the change and I don't want to lose sight of that. Like These are the people that we need in those spaces and, and they should also be recognized, right? It's not about the terrible experience, it's also about lifting up the people that are transforming systems and trying to create a well-being system for young people. Um, so for me, like I didn't experience much placements except for uh, my time in the detention center until I was um, released on house arrest. But for me, the when I went to the detention center, my brother was going in and out of the detention center. So when I went there, everybody knew who my brother was. So they're like, "Oh, this is you know, this is his brother." Mm -hmm. And so they kind of looked at me in a way that made me feel less than who I was while I was going through one of the worst situations I could imagine being in. And so having people just kind of put the image of me being, you know, just such a terrible person kind of just made my time at the detention center a lot worse than what, you know, probably should have should have been. And so I think they were kind of with the trauma of being in detention center for the first time and being on lockdown and just kind of being away from family, they the way they talked about me and just went about their care with me kind of made me feel like, you know, they played a, a part in making my situation a little worse at the time. I just kind of want to piggyback off of that as well. Um, that didn't happen to me in, in the detention center or any placements, but that happened to me at school, specifically middle school. My sister um, kind of went before me and she was a treble child and then they kind of treated me accordingly. Um, so that's, that's often times what happens. We do have a question online, or a yes. few. Okay. Have you thought about pairing up with attorneys that work in the juvenile field? Let's see. To get a list of places to turn to. We could hand it out for kids with law violations or with DHHS. So partnering with attorneys to develop some um, a list of resources that might be available that they could uh, share with their clients. So this is a great time to bring up the Red Book. Um, <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, um, I decided, um, well, me and some other people, uh, we thought about this concept called the Red Book, and it's something that should be given to every young person um, in juvenile justice and child welfare, um, but it kind of goes off the court improvement project um, book that you guys created. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then um, also with like a couple of grievance forms and just contact information um, and resources as well, because uh, the court improvement project created a lot of res uh, a book with a lot of resources as well. Um, and I think like we have to stop recreating the wheel and, and use what 
you know, wonderful, brilliant people have already created and just make the best use of it. And so um, I think that's in the works, uh, mm -hmm. either from, the, yeah. you know, the, the, the department side or, or other, other spaces. But um, I think that would be a, a good start and we could kind of go from there. But we just have to get it going. So to give more background, Bobby serves on a citizen review panel uh, that's uh, legally obligated organization to review and provide recommendations to the Department of Health and Human Services, and that was our recommendation last year, uh, was to provide that red book to all people, all young people in either juvenile justice or uh, the foster care system to kind of provide that information, provide background. So I think adding that component of legal advice is a good good addition to that. So they, they are working on that. So we're just figuring out logistics and distribution methods. So I just have one other thing to say, and this isn't to like hound the, the court system or anything like that, but um, you know, I think there really is an opportunity to look at the fundamental problems that are already happening. Um, and one of those is when I was in court, uh, the only time I would speak to a lawyer was 10 minutes before court. And I know I'm not the only person that went through that. And I know I'm not the only person, uh, or, and I know there's probably still young people that are going through that. Um, and until we figure out ways to kind of mend those issues, I just feel like the problems are still going to persist with the lack of knowledge, the lack of informed consent, um, and the lack of relationships built in transparency with, with lawyers, public defenders, the court system in general. Sorry. You anything to add, Stanford? I do not. I do. Okay, no, that's fine. Good. Yeah, question top row. Go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you for again for for being here. And I think for far too long we told young people, well, this is what's wrong. This is what you're doing wrong, and it's time for us to listen. And I think that over the past few years, it's gotten better. My question would be: Is as you exited the juvenile justice system, were there supports there? Uh, good enough for you as you transitioned in, you know, out of that age group and into different programs? So for me, like I said, I didn't know my probation officer until the last week before I got off probation. So I didn't get services in probation. And then after ended, after I took the drug test, I never heard from him again until I got my discharge paperwork. So for me, I didn't get the opportunity to experience the services in probation or after probation. Did you have any informal support systems in your life? Just, um, kind of just my, outside, my, outside of the probation world? Um, it would be my family and then the work I do with the youth were kind of my biggest supports. Bobby, what about you? Yeah, um, I, was, I was homeless. I was aged out of foster care and I ended up homeless um, right after I aged out at 19. And, um, by the grace of everything, my sister let me kind of couch surf until I got enough money to get my own apartment, which was a couple months down the road, but I got a job right away. And um, yeah, yeah, but I don't think there was enough um, kind of transfer um, of, of community services or programs or anything like that. Um, and I feel like that's still one of the biggest things that I advocate for today is there needs to be better transition to adulthood um, for young people, whether that's connecting them to community supports, um, positive or financial. Uh, some people just don't have that, right? They, they don't have supports, whether informal or formal. Um, and the system could do a, a, a bit of a better job at that. We do have a couple more um, online questions. So go ahead, go ahead. any tips to encourage our youth to utilize therapy and other services when they aren't necessarily receptive to change? Um, I would, with therapy, it, 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 you have to be comfortable with doing it and you have to be comfortable with the person you're talking to. So a lot of times, like the first time when I started doing it, I was against it. I didn't really want to talk to somebody I didn't know and so kind of, the, the way the therapist kind of worked with me and helped me build uh, a relationship with her before we started working on things that I was going through kind of helped me with the experience. But if you don't have people around you that are supportive of the idea of you doing therapy, then it can be hard and 
there's like a, a stigma attached to people that do therapy have issues. And so once you kind of get past that and you're open and receptive to the help, it makes it easier for you to kind of build a relationship and kind of talk through those issues and know that there's somebody that you can go to when you need to talk. Yeah, I think um, it only works if one, there's compatibility between the young person and the therapist. Um, and two, if that therapist is going to be there for the long haul, um, if they can help it, right? Sometimes life just happens. Um, and a wise person once told me, you know, everyone needs therapy. And I, I agree with that now today. I absolutely <laughs> agree with that now today. But then I just felt like it was a waste of my time because it wasn't going to last and it wasn't going to help me. Um, and so what would I say to young people um, yeah, if they don't, I don't know. I just feel like it's kind of up to the young person's deci you know, decision. I feel like it should be up to the young person. Um, if therapy is not going to help, uh, you know, be part of that, that process of figuring out what will um, and, and be part of that discussion and that conversation with your team uh, to figure out other opportunities or, or other things. I feel like the quickest thing that systems um, sometimes do is, okay, we'll just slap on some therapy and call that, you know, um, treatment or, or whatever the case is. And sometimes that just doesn't help. Sometimes that's not what people need. Sometimes people just need um, consistency, support, and, and other support in other places. That probably did not help. <laughs> I'm so sorry for asking well, that question. I think you, both made, you both made really good points of it. It's a relationship. It has to be compatibility. And, uh, I mean, it should be almost like dating. If one therapist is not the right, go find the next one, and eventually you'll find a partnership that works. I, 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 that's what I heard from you, too, and I think that's really valuable advice is that give it a shot and don't be afraid to break up with a therapist and try another one. It's not an instant connection. So another question we received online. Um, given that you have a room full of youth-focused professionals, is there anything you need now that one of us could help you with? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I need your help. I need, I need partnership. I need authentic. Well, okay, let me just start from the beginning. I really feel like in order to transform the system, we have to partner with lived experience, and that means power sharing. That's something new um, that may come new to a lot of people, um, but I feel like it's absolutely necessary in order to transform the work. And so um, I do need everyone in this space uh, to meet with me at least one time in their life in the next five years and, and really figure out how we're going to do this for young people to make the system better. Um, I think that we should all kind of take this crazy year of 2020 to really realize like nothing is impossible and, and we can really start thinking um, outside of the box and come up with new innovative ideas. Um, and I think, um, yeah, we should be more human-centered design focused rather than the traditional practices that um, have been used for a very long time that don't work. Um, like she said, we, we need allies and we need partnerships. We need people that are willing to invest as much time into helping the youth as we are. And um, just, you know, working together and collaborating as much as possible to help, you know, make better resources for the people who need them is a big thing. Stanford's got a nonprofit to get going too. <laughs> I do. I do. I definitely do. That's all of our questions online. Great. Any other questions? Here. Well, good. Well, I want to make sure that you two have the last word. We've heard a lot of great questions. Just kind of any closing thoughts, anything that we haven't touched upon, or just kind of any words of wisdom that you would give to the audience in front of you as we depart before we depart? Yeah, I think that... Um Systems partners, systems, probation officers, caseworkers, whoever is working with young people should not be afraid to be transparent about just the limitations that they have, whether that's policies, procedures, whatever the case may be. Um, I promise transparency is going to make it so much better for that young person and the experience so much better because it's a human interaction. They can't help it. It's their job, right? But they're being human and, and being transparent about what's going on. Um, 
I really just hope that everyone focuses on transparency and, and how to do that in a nice way that um, helps families and young people. And, and don't forget about the families, right? The families need help too, especially when it comes to juvenile justice. I feel like families are, the aspect of families are neglected. You know, they may be in impoverished conditions, they may be um, going through some mental health things, but they just fell through the cracks of the system. Um, that doesn't limit the fact that they absolutely need help. Um, so don't forget about the families. Um, I would just say to be, you know, as mindful and understanding, as patient as you can be when working with uh, kids, because there's not a, a one-size-fit-all solution to helping kids. And so just being mindful and just kind of being aware of what they could be going through during this time as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time and your insights, and thank you for your questions. Uh, I'll give one last plug. If you know any young people who want to give back and help improve the probation system, we have a probation youth council at projecteverlast.org under the Current Opportunities tab. Uh, we are looking for new members that... Uh, that Bobby and Sanford can hopefully mentor and uh, help provide feedback to the system. But uh, thank you again. Let's, let's uh, give a round of applause for our panelists.